Pest Control by Moira Gear Hardwick. With a single, well-practiced motion, Ernst flicks a cigarette up from the pack and brings it to his mouth. The filter barely touches his lips, but as he swipes the pack away, it remains behind, dangling precariously. The other hand comes up, a cheap plastic lighter tucked loosely in his grip. With a rasp, it offers up a meager flame. For a moment, the harsh terrain of the old man's weathered face is illuminated by its reluctant glow. Well, boys, Ernst wheezes through a plume of tobacco smoke. I remember when this was a simple job. Drive your truck around, put down some chemical, shoot the breeze with the customers. Mueller isn't listening. He clenches Caldwell's sleeve and stares wildly up at him. No, you got to wet it, he hisses. Otherwise, it'll stick. Caldwell nods anxiously as he fumbles for his water bottle. I ain't saying Form Side A weren't capable of complex behaviors back then. Ernst snags a cigarette between two knobby fingers and pulls it far enough away to dig his thumb into the wiry hairs of his mustache. But it used to be things like eusociality could be exploited, give him some neonicotinoids, and let Trophallaxis do the rest. His hand shaking, Caldwell soaks down the dressing and gingerly presses against the tangle of intestines bulging out from the large gash in Mueller's belly. Mueller clenches his jaw and gurgles out a pained whimper. A gush of crimson seeps up in the bandage. These days, it's all emergency combat medicine, tactical entry, small arms proficiency. Ernst cuts his list short to suck in another lungful of smoke. When you started out, you could squish an ant between your fingers, muttered Caldwell. He glances at the bullet-riddled carapaces piled up around them, back when humans figured we were the dominant species. Ernst dies, crinkles, he coughs through a soulless chuckle. What about them damn aliens, plopping down their technology for a bunch of bugs instead of us? Them pylons changed the game for sure. How long was it before we started getting calls about ants the size of a fist? Then big as dogs. Now look at them. Nods down at one of the carcasses. Put a lot of money into this industry though, I'll tell you that. Mueller screams, rides, and kicks at the ground. Instinctively, Caldwell claps a hand over his mouth to silence him. Oh, let him scream. Ernst kneels beside Muller, gently pulls Caldwell's hand away. Won't hurt nothing now. Caldwell looks frantically over at the gaping hole in the floor. Ernst snorts a blast of air through his nose and brings his attention back. He taps at his pheromone alert badge. The indicator light is softly pulsing red. Caldwell's eyes widen and he scrambles for his weapon. Ernst slips the cigarette out of his mouth and gently offers it to Muller. Muller ignores him. The old man shrugs and flicks it away. Stiffly he stands, shifts his shotgun around in his sling, racks a shell into the chamber. The chattering sound of chit and stabbing into the rock begins echoing up from below. He sounds big, Ernest coughs and spits. Seems like we got the soldiers all riled up. He rubs his nose with the back of his hand. You know, used to be hardly anybody died in this line of work, not all at once anyway. I suppose the chemicals weren't the real good for. Before he can even finish, the first soldier emerges from his hole, his head as wide as his shoulders, mandibles as long as his arms, and Caldwell opens fire. Peace Offering by Roger Lay Riley signed for the package and came back inside the house. What was the delivery? asked his wife Barbara looking up from her tablet. He looked at the label. Actually, it's from Estella. Your ex-wife? How many other Estellas do I know? Apparently, she's trekking in some national park in Brazil at the moment. Been keeping in touch with her, have you? Asked Barbara. Estella stays in touch with a woman at the office, and she told me, he said. Riley understood her anxiety. The new, younger wife needing to be sure she no longer had feelings for the mother of his children. I expect she's trying to walk off her feelings. That was the whole point of her taking a sabbatical after our divorce. Eager to change the subject as he tore open the package. Looks like a bulb or a corn. It's a plant anyway. Hang on, there are instructions. We're supposed to plant it in a pot of damp compost and leave it on the windowsill. Barbara grunted and went back to her tablet. Riley knew better than to expect her to do the watering. He planted the bulb. A shoot appeared within a few days and the tip immediately began to form into a fat bud. Two weeks later, he came in down into the kitchen and found that the bud had opened and produced a strange and beautiful red bloom. He had seen nothing like it. 
so he used the Flower Checker app on his phone. Barbara came down a few minutes later, roused from sleep and wearing the silk dressing gown he'd bought for her, looking lovely even without her makeup. Where's my tea? You said you'd bring me one up. Riley ignored her. He double-bagged the plant and put it in their wood-burning stove. He was kneeling, adding paper and kindling from the basket at its side. What are you doing? asked his wife. He stood, picked up his phone and read from the screen. I can't pronounce the name of it, but it says proto-carnivorous plant. The flower's spores secrete an opiate-like psychoactive substance, which causes a rush of pleasure as they are inhaled. The spores lodge in the sinus cavities of the victim and develop filaments which infiltrate the brain and quickly kill it. They utilize the nutrients of decay in their growth cycle. Nasty. Very nasty, Estella, he muttered. That bitch, she tried to kill us, said Barba. Hell hath no fury. Yes, but murder? Look, I'm not excusing her, but she hasn't got over our affair and the final breakup of the marriage. She can't accept the relationship was on its last wobbly legs and our affair was just the final push. Until she accepts that, she won't be able to take the next step from anger to acceptance. Yes, we've gone over this repeatedly. She just has to come to terms with it. You both changed as time passed. You weren't the same people you were when you married 20 years ago. Well, yes, said Riley, but we went through a lot together and now she's alone. Well, what are you going to do about it? Well, I'm going to burn this bloody thing first, he said as he knelt and struck a match. Then, I'm going to send her an email. Dear Estella, thanks for the bulb. It looked very interesting. Barbara and I are going on holiday for a month, so I gave it to your sister. It'll be a nice little project for her and her kids. It'll be interested to see what it grows into. Something exotic, I expect. Thanks again, and I hope this means you're moving on emotionally and getting over your feelings of bitterness towards Barbara and me. I hope that, in the interest of our sons, we can become friends eventually. Let's move on like adults. I'm sure you'll find somebody to share your life with soon. After all, they say 50 is the new 40, and you're still closer to 50, well, than 60. Best regards, Martin. Rain by Matthew Bielas I miss the rain. It's been years. I've long since lost track of how many since I saw it last. Since anyone saw it last. It's been so long that no one really remembers it anymore, except for what you'd find in dictionaries. I remember being rain so much more than those bland descriptions. I remember falling asleep to it, listening to the soft, even sound of running water, distinct from yet blending into all else. I remember sitting by windows, letting my mind wander while tiny droplets formed patterns on the glass, ambient light casting tiny shadows. I think I'm the only one who remembers, but all I have are faint flickers of memory. I live in a city of mist, an endless fog blankets the entire city, providing moisture without the need for rain, a fog that is unobtrusive, casting what it hides not in opaqueness but in shades of grey. No one remembers the awe instead of the mist. It simply was and now is. All that we remember was that before the mist, there was rain, and now there's none. With the mist came a loss of knowledge. We lost contact with the world, with our own history, where we came from. No one, save for maybe the city government, knows where the city is what country it's part of, how old it is, or even what its real name is. All we call it now is The City. We know of nothing else. One day, I tried to leave. It wasn't because I was dissatisfied with city life. It's a laid-back place. It was due to wanderlust, an urge to see what was beyond. I really wasn't doing anything else anyway. So I packed my things and walked on the main road for hours. The city was big but it wasn't infinite. Eventually, all that was left was the road itself, but no other ground I could see. The only sounds were my lonely footsteps upon the asphalt. Gray-white mist surrounded me, blanketing my clothes with a faint dampness I couldn't feel. The road kept going. I looked back to find the city was out of sight, hidden by a now opaque mist. I knelt down by the side of the road and reached for the ground beside it, it was hard, an unnatural substance, the same color as the mist. It felt almost like steel used in buildings, but 
somehow more organic. It was wet with condensed mist seeping down into cracks I could barely feel. I continued. Nothing happened for ages until I heard a sound. A steady, even sound, splashing in the distance. A sound that I identified immediately, even though I hadn't heard it for countless years. My pace quickened as I heard the rainfall from my childhood. Eventually, I saw it. A shimmering form breaking the opacity of the mist. The white fog gave way into more color. A sickeningly gray-brown earth extending beyond the horizon. It was entirely featureless. The rain fell unceasingly, causing faint wisps of smoke to emerge with each impact. I slowed my pace until I felt the thick pane of glass in front of me, barring my progress. It bore no seams or faults. There was no way in or out. Its only peculiarity was a plaque etched into the glass. It said in large, plain text, The city is all that's left. There is nothing else. Turn back now and the acid rain continued to fall on the remains of the world. Security by Severiaia It began as many things do, in the dead of night. Dad, cried the boy, there are monsters under my bed. The covers were down before he was fully awake, and he rolled smoothly to his feet. His mind begins processing the situation, while his body continues with the rehearsed, automatic movements. Automatically, reach for the rifle while scanning the room. Mentally, consider whether to rouse his wife and review the room clearing procedures as they move through together, if there may be a threat. There's no one else in the room, save for his wife who's quietly awake now in bed. No alarms are going off, and no quiet lights signal a breach in the house. All is quiet since the boy's initial cry. Automatically, shoulder the rifle, stride silently to the door minding the sight lines around the frame. Mentally, he's finally reached the age where nightmares begin, but nothing is wrong. All the same, demonstrating security might help put him at ease. He crosses the hallway and eases the boy's door open. Rifle still up, but careful to keep the barrel clear of anywhere his son could be. A quick sweep of the darkness reveals the room to be clear, save for his son sitting up in bed. Perhaps some theatrics. You there, under the bed. He challenges quietly, falling back to his old command voice. What business do you have here? The response is just as soft, gravelly, and sibilant, and something stirs in the black beneath the bed frame. There is no end to the monsters in this world. His finger moves to the trigger. We tire of flight, and we seek refuge here. He considers carefully. I am the end of monsters in this world and none may breach this refuge. How many of you tire? We are many. Then I will build more beds. Do not wake my children.